maybe do a small demo later. So I just have that ready. <coughs> and is this working? Okay, yeah. Well, hi, I'm Stafford Horn, and I work as a hobby developer on the Linux kernel. Um, the project I work on is OpenRISC. It's a CPU architecture. And I guess people have probably seen Risk Five a lot in the news lately. Does anybody know Risk Five? Yeah. This is Open Risk. This is older, very very old, and it had not really had a good maintainer for the last since about 2008 or so. And so I came along and I found it and I started just playing with it, and, and now I'm the maintainer. Um, I want to just talk a bit about introduction to me, and then I did work this year to get the OpenRISC SMP implementation upstream, and that's now in 4.15 or 4.15. <coughs> I just merged two weeks ago or so, so yeah, I'm very happy about that. Uh, okay, so. If you don't know what open risk is, uh, I'll explain it a bit. So does everyone know what an FPGA is? Anybody? FPGA? Most people, yeah. So what it is, FPGA, is if you see there's a um, diagram here. This is basically usually everybody has their system on chip, a little board, and it has a, a CPU in it. But that CPU, you can't change it. What the FPGA allows you to do is program um, that a device that has a bunch of little gates and logical cells to act like something else. So it can act like a CPU, or it can act like a, a HDMI decoder, or a network device. It's used a lot in, in network devices for you know, handling really fast traffic and doing filtering and, and things like that. Um, you can, there's a thing called IP cores, which is basically if you want to put a device into an FPGA, then you can buy these IP cores from companies like Altera <coughs> or Cadence or ARM. And um, you can put them into your device and you can test them and then later you can put them on a, a real chip, an, an ASIC. And um, I, I was working on FPGAs for a while and I thought, well, I'm an open source guy as well, so what's... Um, there in the open source world for FPGAs. And I found this open course project and open risk and, and a few other tools, which uh, I just list them here. I won't go into details. So that's um, a bit of a background on what that is. Now, open risk is a architecture that was developed in around 2000. It has a 32 bit CPU. There, there's also a 64 bit spec, um, but it's not really implemented. So I'll just say it's 32-bit. Uh, it has 32 general purpose registers. Uh, the main implementations have a delay slot, which I won't go into details on that. We have a MMU, and it's been in the Linux kernel since 2010. And it's kind of nice. You can boot it up on an FPGA at 50 megahertz. It boots in around five seconds. And if you want to see more detail, I, there's a link to the spec on the whole architecture there. Um, any questions? I'm just going to go through. Yeah, <coughs> any questions, you can stop me anytime. Just some um, comparison with other soft cores. I mean, there are many others, like Elias Micro or even ARM, you can say is a soft core, but these are the kind of the minor ones, similar to Open Risk. Uh, one is Open Risk, which just a comparison, it's open, uh, meaning you can have the Verilog code. The spec is open, so you can implement it yourself if you, if you want to. Open Risk has an MMU. These other ones also do. Now, Risk Five, it, it has an MMU now, and but there wasn't an MMU in the spec for a while. So I, I think they're starting to work on that, having an actual MMU architecture. Um, so the 4.15 port is no MMU? Uh, it, does, it does have one, but the thing is, in the spec, there was, there's really no MMU in the spec. So now that it's in 4.15, mm -hmm. 
that has to be the spec for the MMU now. So it now is it has got a, an MMU spec because it's in the kernel and it has to if they want to have kernel support, they're going to probably need to use that MMU or send patches. Um, it's 32-bit, which means it, it's better for smaller systems, I think. Uh, RISC-V is 64-bit, pretty much exclusively. What is that? 64 or 128. Yeah, it's very... I think the, the, in, the kernel implementation is 64-bit right now. And um, Linux support now... Risk five. I, I gave this presentation last year, and it was in progress. And now, just a few weeks ago, I, the same day, I got the SMP code in the in the kernel. Um, Risk five got into the kernel as well. So there was a, a few news articles that were interesting because the news article said, uh, like, open source Risk is having a good time. And it's completely different systems, but um, we both. We both showed up in the news articles together, which was interesting. And then, but the other thing is silicon, is, is there any actual A6 running open risk? It's very limited for open risk. Um, we have a, f we know just from the community that Samsung and a few Chinese companies put open risk in their, on their SOC, maybe for power management or other things, but um, nothing that's public. You can't get a, de a development board with it. Uh, Risk Five, they do have some uh, development boards, but I think none with an MMU yet. So you don't have any development board that you can run Linux on. Any questions? Where can I go to Risk Five? Where can you get Risk Five board? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, <laughs> what can I get open Risk board? If you want an open Risk board, you can pretty much get any FPGA mm -hmm. right now. And and uh, I have been using the DE0 Nano from Altera. Mm -hmm. It's very cheap. It's I think around <coughs> Ichimayan or something. You can get it. Uh, I'll show you later how to build OpenRisk for DE0 Nano <coughs> and how to program it. It takes only about um, yeah, five minutes or so. Can we use Zarya School? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've just, somebody sent me a RT, it's a Xilinx Digilent RT, it has the Arctic 7, and that works, works fine. Um, I did, I did debug a UART controller and got that working, and now it's working fine. But, yeah? Yeah, can I ask you, do you have a, an SMB tick box as well for this here? Ah, uh, I should add it, yeah, that, this is an old slide, but. <coughs> I, I, Risk Five does have SMP support, and I, it was interesting because they call it. They have this like uh, uh, I'm going into details. But they have like a kind of governor that when they want to make IPI calls, they call into their kind of BIOS to say, "Hey, send an IPI call to another core." And, and we, it's, it's kind of interesting because they have an instruction to say IPI, and that goes off to their their governor kind of to send the IPI. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of quite interesting. Um, uh, what the mean that the this five uh, MMU? Yeah, it's uh, kind of. <coughs> it, kind of. It means uh, chotto. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 no, the, the meaning is basically before they they didn't really have it. They had an implementation for one, but there was no specification for one. Um, and so, but now that they're in the kernel, I, I believe they're going to harden up that specification. And the current implementation is their their recommended <coughs> MMU implementation uh, because so that's a, that it's the auto specification. <coughs> yeah, because uh, their specification so far has been really the ISA. They're really concentrating on these are our instruction sets, but <coughs> some of their infrastructure wasn't there. But now that, like I said, as the kernel is there now, they really want to make sure that infrastructure is, is locked down. So this kind of, maybe we can have a checkbox there, but it's just, it was, that was something that always got me when looking at risk five in the early days, they didn't have the infrastructure. And it, but now it, it might be really coming together. Yeah. Um, just some details on the upstream progress. So what are the things that are going on? Um, 
I've been working, so one of the things that I've really been working on is making sure that all the stuff that has been worked on for open risk, um, such as the, uh, lots of college like thesis projects have produced lots of open risk code, but it doesn't get pushed upstream. And some of that is the uh, GDB ports. Uh, the, a lot of the Linux stuff hasn't been upstream. There was no maintainer for a while. Um, Newlib, which is a C library, um, those weren't upstream. And I've really been working on that. So <coughs> Linux is now upstream. Uh, GDB, <coughs> I've been working all through the year to get uh, the code. Uh, basically, the code had lots of like, doxygen comments in it, which is nice, but FSF doesn't like it. Like any comments in their code, or something. they they need a really specific format for their comments, and so they need to we needed to clean that up and a lot of indentation things. So I just worked through cleaning all of that up, and I got everything okayed. But there was one um, copyright assignment. So if ever you uh, have given code to the FSF, they want to make you sign a paper saying that you sign over your copyright. And one guy he had copyright for GCC and and bin utils and libc but not GDB so we couldn't get his code upstream yet so uh, it should be sorted out by yesterday or today so we should be able to finally get that upstream um, and then just some other things throughout throughout the last year I've been working on several QMU fixes so the SMP support that I talked about a bit is, is upstream there are a few bug fixes um, another project that many people have seen is the UC libc, uh, the new UC libc ng that is being maintained and <coughs> regular releases are being made. Uh, the open risk support is in there now. Um, the, the maintainer of that has been just pulling our, our work out of our repositories and bringing them into his, his repository. But he had a problem with uh, MPTL, the, the threading support, and I helped him through the last three weeks or so, and we got it all working, and it's it's working fine now. So, you see them C is is available. Yeah. Who, who's the maintainer on that? It's Valdemar something. Okay. Um, if you just look up that, you find his page right away. He also has a a build root kind of clone called Open ADK, Open uh, Appliance Development Kit. It's it's similar to build root, but he uses it to test. UC libc and it supports many architectures as well. Why oh, didn't he push it upstream into build root then? He actually does. So everything he does, he pushes upstream into build root. But I think it, for some reason he just maintains uh, another kind of fork. I think he works very close with build root. I'm, I'm not sure really the story behind it. Um, and then I think at first maybe build root dropped the UC libc support and so he. Was that? It was that yeah. He he was he he for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So he wanted. What happened there? Well, I, it's a long story, but the question is, what happened to UC libc? Um, I think I won't go into it. Yeah, the, the maintainer just. Well, basically, the the main thing that happened there is the maintainers got really busy with build root, and. Oh, yeah. So the UC libc guys, they started build root as a test bed for UC libc. They got very busy, and then they started um, to kind of bring in other C libraries. And um, they just haven't done releases for a while. And then Muscle is also supported. There's also a glibc um, port, but that hasn't gone upstream yet, so I won't help with that. So that's the progress with upstreaming so far this year. Um, the one that is the big elephant in the room, or the one that we really can't get upstream yet, is is GCC. Now I, I created a release this year and posted the binaries for 5.4.0, which is actually very far behind. Um, but we we can't really get this upstream because one of the core initial developers for this. He won't sign over his free software foundation copyright, and um, we're just waiting for that. So every year we kind of send him a mail, are you okay to do it now? And he says, 
my board members don't want me to sign it. So, um, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. And, and we're, we're quite, a, quite a ways behind. As you see, um, GCC has a few different releases so far this year. Or not this year. Um, in the recent past, they had a 6 release, which has a lot of nice features. 7 was released this year. And 8 is in development for release next year. So we are three releases behind. Uh, which would be unfortunate, but um, this guy, Richard Henderson, he, he saw me working on Open Risk, and I don't know if you've seen um, this, but he he sent a mail saying, uh, I saw you working on Open Risk, and I maintain a, a branch of it for build testing purposes, and he's been maintaining the o Open Risk 7 branch, so it has a lot of features, like one is like tail call, tail call added, so you can do calls to functions without using the stack, which is really nice. Um, or recursive calls without using the stack. Which, um, but anyway, it's, he added a lot of features, which um, is very promising. So I, I plan to start working on that, getting his patches um, you know, brought into the open risk ecosystem and, and us maintaining them locally until we can get the GCC upstream but open source is very nice okay so next I'll just talk about uh, SMP work uh, so SMP is you know what allows us to do multi-core processing on our systems and I'll just talk a little bit about how it works and and how we implemented it so first off you know, what are the goals why do I want to do all of this uh, one is you know, for the open risk architecture, since we don't have a lot of resources, we want something really simple and low cost, and I'll show you what that means. Um, and then also, I, mean, I guess I just wanted to learn a lot about the Linux kernel. And so this is kind of our architecture. So the first thing I had to do um, was basically get the architecture specification updated. So the open risk architecture specification doesn't specify multi-core. Uh, it has some atomic instructions that mention that it can, it, it, it allows synchronization between multiple cores, but not really an SMP configuration, which allows communication between those multiple cores. And so one thing that we added here was this thing, <coughs> an own pick. It's the, the open risk multi-core programmable interrupt controller, but really what it is is a, an uh, IPI, interprocessor interrupt controller, which just allows processors to send interrupts between themselves, or send signals or messages between themselves through a way of interrupts. Now, um, well, I'll just say, like, it's kind of interesting, I'll, I'll explain this a bit later, but it's unique as um, interrupts are routed to every core. So as you can see here, let's say you have a UART as your IRQ source, that actually gets sent to every core. So how, how will that work um, if there's a keyboard press or some signal comes in? Every core doesn't want to wake up. So actually, um, every open risk core has a full 32-bit maskable pick inside. So when they start up, they mask each other. Everyone masks the interrupt except for one like the leader, the core zero, and core zero will take over the interrupts. And if they need to do some load balancing, they'll send it instruction uh, to this multi, uh, this own pick, which will say, hey, you know, do something, and the message goes, we have these, every core has a status and control signal that will say, okay, I want to write a, con write a message to somebody else, and then that interrupt will be sent to the other core, and the message will be delivered, and then maybe it will do a you know, rebalancing of interrupts or something like that. So, it's, but, so with that, just this one extra core, which is pretty simple, this extra piece of hardware, we are able to achieve uh, SMP. It's kind of a hack, but it, it works well, and uh, for a small system, it's, it's okay, I think, or not. 
Maybe it doesn't scale as well as ARM and the GIC, but it's not as complicated, so I can support it. Um, but so what else do we need to do other than uh, IPI, the interprocessor interrupts? Another thing that's really important is about memory barriers. So if ever you start working on SMP, you really have to worry about memory barriers, and there's things like strong versus weak. Uh, memory models, uh, memory sync points, cache coherency. So if you write a uh, value to memory, how do you know that it's going to get picked up? I mean, how do you know that that cache, the write to the cache, gets flushed to memory, and then the other processors see that same thing in their cache? Maybe another processor has a, a cache issue. And then another thing I was talking to um, was Mark Zongjie, who's the maintainer for the GIC and the whole IRQ chip <coughs> infrastructure. Uh, Mark was reviewing our, our, um, our new PIC code and he uh, really questioned a lot of these things and mentioned this transitivity, which is how do you know that, I guess it's things get in the right order. I, I don't know if you remember what it is, but so this, if, if you want to know about memory barriers, there's this really neat document that's in the kernel uh, memory barriers.txt and it has these kind of diagrams and you can read about it it's really neat so so for example if CPU 1 it says okay let me write this value to B and then this value to D if CPU 2 is reading that with a, a weak memory model um, this one might send a write um, barrier which will flush the things to the memory but CPU 2 might not see that in the same order if CPU 2 hasn't done a, a read barrier. So that there's some architectures require both write barriers and read barriers to sync things. And open risk, we don't really have that. We just have a, um, a single uh, sync instruction, and that flush, flushes things to memory. And when that flush happens, it makes sure that all caches are in sync. And so any reads will, if so our write barrier automatically kind of triggers a read barrier on the other core, which maybe slows things down a bit. So you have some signals between all the caches of the yeah, CPU all, cores? All, all, um, the question is, do we have some signals between all the caches? What we have is a cache snoop mechanism, where every cache is listening on the memory bus for any writes. So it just sees a write to this cache line, and it will will automatically invalidate it, uh, which which might cause issues if you don't really care about that cache line. But um, it's, it's what we do. Yeah. So this is this was one kind of interesting thing, and so here, um, what to handle this? As I mentioned, we have atomic instructions and. This is just, this is um, the atomic.h inside of our, our implementation. There's also like bits.h or bitops.h, which handles other operations. But this is basically how it works. Let's say you have an operation like an add or a or or something. What, you need to, what we do is we have this new instruction load uh, word atomic, and this will load the value from memory. And then we would do some operation on the value and um, with another value. And then we would store that operation back to memory. And what we do here is there's a branch if not no flag. So if there's no flag, which would mean that the um, atomic operation was unsuccessful, we try again. So every time this happens, it flushes. And so this is a kind of stuff, you, you see this in ARM code or every kind of code, they have these ARM instructions, I mean, atomic instructions, and so we were able to do that. Um, then with the first implementation, we had used this kind of code to also implement spin locks and, and read-write locks, which is what you really need for um, locking on a broken on a um, yeah, SMP system. On a regular system, I think you can just, on a U, 
UP system, unit processor system, you can just disable interrupts and then you're sure that you're not going to get interrupted. But on a, um, on a multi-core system, you, you need something a bit more sophisticated. So we had, this, uh, we had a kind of spin lock implementation like this. But when that was first sent, Peter uh, Zilstra, who is kind of like the lock guru, guru in the kernel, he suggested Q spin locks, which is and Q read write locks, which is supported really only on x86 right now. Um, but it's a really neat cache line aware architecture that can can do some spin locks in generic code. So as long as you have your atomics coded correctly, and they have to yeah, you can just include Q spin locks and Q read write locks, and you get atomic. Um, spin locks and everything. So we just deleted all of our spin lock code and used this, and it, was, it works well. Any questions? Yeah? Hey, can I ask you so, uh, about the cache coherency you were talking about on the previous slide? I think. Yes. Uh, is it possible to disable cache and stuff like that during development to make it easier? For yeah, I, I had to do that actually. I found, I found what looked like a, a data cache issue where uh, it wasn't, I, I was debugging. And I could see that one value was, if I go to this core and I read the memory, it, it just wasn't even, it wasn't like a timing thing. They were just out of sync. And um, I disabled caches. So that's one thing about, if we just go back to open this architecture, we can, all of these white areas, for example, we can disable these. So instruction cache, data cache, um, you know, we do that quite a lot. That helps, but yeah, you, you want caches. But it, I disabled them, and I didn't actually see any performance issues. <laughs> <laughs> so, why do you have two wish code interfaces by four? Uh, I think one for instruction read writes and yeah. one for data read writes. So, the question is why do we have two wishbone interfaces? Wishbone is our, you know, our memory interface, one for instruction and one for data. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, uh, once we get our locking all good, we, we need to actually start making our, our architecture you know, functions and initializations and, and some of our drivers um, per CPU. So one thing we have is this per CPU structure. So for example, um, every CPU has a, a tick timer or a clock, which is a clock event device. And as you can see, we have this special case in this defined per CPU. That's something that you'll find through the kernel. Um, it, it's, I guess, usually an architecture-specific code. Maybe you have that in drivers as well. But it will allow us to have um, one instance of this struct in memory, in a cache-aligned um, memory location, so that when a CPU wants to access their, their details, they don't have to contend for the cache, it should be good. And so you define it like that per um, CPU, and then later on, if you want to use it, um, there's a per CPU, where do I have it? Uh, CPU info, per CPU. Oh, per CPU, yeah. So when you want to get that event uh, device, you have this per CPU clock event risk timer, which is the name there, and then the CPU which is the s and processor ID. It tells you I'm on processor 0 or processor 1 or processor 32. And that will, this one, s and processor ID reads, it, it has to be defined for each architecture as well. It reads from a register that says I'm core 0 or I'm core 1 or whatever. It's kind of very basic, but. Um, and the last thing I really want to talk about, maybe I'm going quick, is uh, the timer sync. So another thing you might have is if you have multiple cores and they start up at different times, um, it, a lot of times events, when, when they're handled in the kernel, like handle reading from a queue, they'll store a time saying, okay, this was last accessed at this time, or, or different things use timekeeping, and they use the, the tick timer. So the tick timer would schedule an event. 
if one core uh, handles that event and then later another core handles it, if the times are off, the kernel will complain saying, oh, I moved back in time, or oh, it's been 15 uh, ticks when it should be zero ticks what, what I expected. They will complain. So we don't really want to go back in time, or we don't want to go into the future when we're servicing these events. It's kind of comp more complicated. Maybe not more complicated, but if anybody knows how to explain it better. Um, and one, one way a lot of systems do it is they actually have a global timer that they will just read the time when they need to. And um, it, as I said earlier, I wanted to have a more simple architecture and not add many more hardware items or new drivers. So uh, we actually do something that MIPS does, which is a timer sync. I think they, they originally copied this from the x86 code. Like very old x86 code had um, the tick timer sync logic. And then this got copied into uh, MIPS and maybe other processors. And they've moved on, but we've used this. And so what happens is you know, when a C core one might come up, mm -hmm. it comes online and it says, I need to sync with core zero. Core zero actually kicks off all the CPUs to sync. I mean, kicks off the CPUs to start up. And so when it kicks off a CPU to start up, it, they run in this loop. Basically, core zero will run in a loop and write the time to this init count. And then core one will, and then it's, core zero sets a lock, says, uh, I, the code is a bit complicated, but core zero will lock and wait for core one to read that init count. And then they both kind of loop and make sure their caches are all synced up. And after three loops, um, core one takes the value and it, the, the time should be in sync. It's kind of really complicated caching and locking code, but it, it works. And so yeah, that's, that's, yeah. So with the interrupt, so each time here can generate an interrupt to uh, that's local to each CPU. Yeah, yeah, there's, the timers don't raise interrupts uh, it, as a wire, wire sense. They're all local, so it just kicks off. There's an interrupt vector for interrupts, and there's a separate interrupt vector for time timers. Why is this better than a global timer? Because uh, we didn't have to add any. Why? Why isn't this better than a global timer? We didn't have to add any extra hardware. Um, you have four timers. You have a global timer. You would just have one. Yeah. No, I mean, every core already has the timer in it. So you could. We could disable it. <coughs> um, add a global timer. Yeah. It would save you resources. Yeah. yeah. I, we can do that. But I, I just wanted to keep the code as, min as, as minimal as possible, just to add the timer sync. Um, yeah, the, there is an implementation with the global timer. Um, that was how it was originally implemented, but the way they did the sync was really hacky, so I just removed the hack and I added this sync. I think the yeah, next step is definitely add a global timer driver that can, that can do the sync that way. That's what most other systems do. Because this seems really <laughs> Yeah, this is the issue I had with the, the caches also not working. And sometimes this would write, the locking got kind of confused if the, the locks didn't get uh, cache synced correctly. And um, I, I just say with caching, fix that. But, but yeah, maybe this is, I think the ARM uh, V7 architecture kind of implements it prefer to use the per CPU uh, timer yeah. over a single low cost timer because I believe it's uh, a better performance. Yeah. So I don't know, this might be a little bit in, like, for setup, <coughs> it's a bit iffy. <laughs> but uh, so it might be good to use per CPU timers. And, and yeah. Now, um, the other thing is, while I was working on this, uh, I had to debug, make sure that the 
the locking was actually working correctly. Um, the kernel has a few, um, few facilities inside of it, like lock depth. And lock depth, you can enable it, and it will validate your locks. It will, um, when it, you can turn it on, and whenever you take a lock, it makes sure there's no deadlock scenario. And um, it also, there's a way to run the kernel so when it starts up, it does some stress testing on the locks. And I, I implemented that in the open risk as part of that. And it, it's something you can enable and disable. So what you need to do is actually put this kind of code whenever the system, so usually um, if you're in a driver, you might disable interrupts. Um, that actually is, we'll call lock depth to disable, to say interrupts are off. But when you're in low level code, like servicing a timer or something, the low level uh, architecture might s automatically shut off interrupts and Linux doesn't know about that. Or when you return from um, servicing an interrupt, it might re-enable interrupts automatically. And so you need to put into your low level code these kind of uh, you know, calls to lock depth on or lock depth off, which is these trace hard IR, <coughs> hard IR keys off and trace hard IR keys on, which is kind of interesting. You, need, you do that. And, um, but one of the things that locked up also requires is a pretty good um, unwinder. So we had to implement, or I implemented a, previously the unwinder just looked through the stack and found anything that looked like code, and that was part of this, that was one of the, the stack frames. Um, now we use the proper frame pointers and we can do the lock unwind, or we can do the stack unwinding with frame pointers, and so locked up works better now. And so that was helpful. And yeah, so this is it. Um, in the end, these were the patches that went into the kernel. You can see the SPDX patch right there. <laughs> and then um, hit our code. Everyone should get one. Yeah, we got <laughs> one. And then um, these are all of our patches. So the, the um, atomic support, byte ops, comp exchange, uh, open risk, uh, Q spin locks, and these other things, uh, lock depth support. And uh, timer sync, which is controversial. I, I thought, but nobody, nobody commented on that code, and I set the sent the patches. So, um, yeah, yeah. And that, that's if anybody wants to go into these patches and look at them, I can show you afterwards. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Also, you were working on the uh, QM or the real. Uh, uh, oh, as part of the work, we didn't have QMU SMP support, so I implemented it because I was working on just the board, and it was very difficult because the, yeah. the cycle was so slow. So I implemented SMP support in QMU, yeah. and um, yeah, and then that sped up the development quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the same with BIOS too, it was ten times faster. Yeah. <laughs> so currently, we only cover uh, what's the QM Oh no! It, it has uh, both QM and um, and uh, FPGA support. Oh, oh, thank you. I'll show you. Um, let me see how long this takes. Mm -hmm. If do you have time? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know why when I escape this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Something. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is open risk. Uh, let me make this small. Smaller. Can you see that? Um, yeah. So when I run QMU, I always run this. I'll just show you what it is. Open risk <coughs> QMU OR1K. So this is my just QMU wrapper script, and so. Uh, this is the, the Linux, uh, VM Linux that I have built already. And these are some of the options. 
I can turn on GDB through PMU. This is just how to set up my serial. Um, there's two setups I have here. One is with the monitor setup, so you can have PMU run monitor mode, and then I can stop it and I can look at registers in PMU. But I, I usually turn that off because <coughs> I just want to. Then you SMP CPUs two, RAM thirty two, and then this is all the how you run. And then if I run it, oh wait, I want to just run this. So then this is running the kernel, and then I don't know why this hasn't looked into it. This takes a while to start up, but you can see up here it says synchronize encounters for CPU one done, brought up one nodes, uh, two CPUs. Now and then I mean this is just busy box, so I can do like proc CPU info. And I can see the CPU. This is uh, so it's 415. This is I was testing. For some reason, after I the latest one doesn't run on FPGA yet. I need to bisect something. <laughs> if I go back to 413, it, it's still running on FPGA, but after the update, it doesn't boot. So I need to bisect that. Um, but uh, but I just show you one other so. I can just escape that. Another thing is just how we built, I, I was mentioning this fuse sock thing. Um, core list cores. So there's this tool, fuse sock. And so these are, for example, the cores that are available. Let me just show you what this looks like. Uh, Sock. These are the different. Uh, so one of them is. I'll just go to local cores. Dio nano. So this is like my Dio Nano multi-core system, and this is actually how you build it. So you say um, this is a few sock configuration, which is the build uh, system for a um, an SOC. And I want you know the advanced debug sys, which will give me JTAG, uh, Altero virtual JTAG, which is a proprietary core actually. So the only proprietary core in this whole thing is this Altera virtual JTAG. And everything else is open source. The JTAG tab. This is the CPU core, more 1KX. There's a more 1K bootloader. I think this is some code that I have is. Anyway, um that if you look at the inside of there, there's actually the Verilog code. Maybe you guys don't care, but um, Orps up top. So that has to exist as well, where I I have my CPUs instantiated and you connect them all together. This is the Verilog code. <coughs> but then when I want to build, I just say fuse sock build. Uh, I don't have it in my history. Fuse sock build do nano, multi-core, and then that, oh, what happened? Plus Rs, not support of the fuse. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's underscore. Yeah, so then this brings in all the cores. It creates a cortis. It creates a, the whole project. And then it starts building it all at the same time. And then this is actually running the Altera tools and compiling everything. And it takes like 15, <coughs> five minutes to compile. And then you have your bitstream, and you can send it off. And then I use open OCD <coughs> to connect. But there's no board on this machine right now, so I can't do that. But FuseSock is pretty neat for, for doing um, so hardware that, development. Is that particular configuration of the FuseSock available somewhere so I can try it on my? Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, the repositories mm -hmm. for FuseSock. When you get FuseSock, you install it. Mm -hmm. You type FuseSock in it, and there's a, a public repository. It's just like you know, apt-get or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it will bring in that repository, and it will have all the cores available that are the public ones. You can have your own, but like this um, multi-core Dio Nano is in the public repository. Okay. So you just type. You install FuseSock, FuseSock in it, and then you type build, and it should do this. That's awesome. And 
you don't have to look at uh, Verilog code or mess with <coughs> the command line itself. And so it, we can support Altera and Xilinx and simulators like iVerilog all at the same time, just through the same commands. Okay, um, yeah, I'll just bring my slide back up. Yes, what about the process of uh, when I get the bit stream, how do I get uh, when it's running on that? Yeah. Or see is that documented somewhere? Um, I, along with the patches I sent upstream, I updated the README to document this, so you can look in there. Um, but yeah, so once you have this done, you then do fusoc program, PGM, and that will actually program the board. I, I just killed the build so that the bitstream is gone, but you'll just program the board. And I have an open OCD, and you, once you get open OCD connected to the board, through the JTAG, you can use it the way you use open OCD always, which I won't go into. If you want to see it, I can show you, you know, send me a mail. And if you want to send me a mail, this is my contact details. So for me, uh, you can see this in the slides that are up on the Jamboree website, and then for OpenRisk as well. This is our GitHub repo with all these projects. Um, we have a IRC room, and we have a mailing list, and this is our main website. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.